Coming up on Tech News Today, Samsung brings back the start button to Windows. Twitter turns off more functions for developers. And Apple Motorola patent peace. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, August 28th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website or blog, plus more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs with automatic device scaling. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT8. And by Carbonite Online Backup. Automatic, continual, and unlimited backup for your computer files for only $59 a year. Try it free at Carbonite.com and use offer code TNT and get two bonus months with purchase. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we attempt to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news views. Apple has filed its request with the court to have eight of the 28 infringing Samsung devices banned from sale in the United States. The devices include the Galaxy S 4G, the Galaxy S Showcase, four versions of the Galaxy S2, the Droid Charge, and the Galaxy Prevail. Apple will need to show irreparable harm would be caused by the sale of these phones. Samsung, as expected, said they intend to fight the ban. You guys want to hear specs on LG's new Optimus G? Yeah. Okay, good. It's the first phone coming to Korea with LTE and a quad-core 1.5 gigahertz Snapdragon S4 Pro. LG's fully integrated touch technology is built into the display, making for a thinner screen and bezel. True HD, IP PS LCD, 2 gigabytes of RAM, a 13 megapixel rear camera, a 1.3 megapixel front camera. Sounds perfect, unless you like jelly bean because it's shipping with ice cream sandwich. Oh, that's too bad. Remember when Craigslist was getting all mad at PadMapper for using its data to plot real yes, estate on a map? I remember. Recently. Well, maybe this news explains that behavior. Craigslist is now using open street, uh, street map data to show housing ads placed on maps. This is currently in the testing phases and is available right now in Portland and in the San Francisco Bay Area. I got the idea that this was a reaction to PadMapper, not the opposite, but who knows. Samsung announced updates to its all-in-one Series 7 and Series 5 desktops for sale in the United States with the launch of Windows 8, October 26th. The models will include 10-point multi-touch support and a Samsung-created start button called the S-Launcher. I'm going to call S-Launcher. it S-Launcher. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Samsung also teased the forthcoming unveiling of a Windows 8 tablet hybrid this weekend at the IFA show in Berlin. Last week, OnLive said the founder, Steve Perlman, would stay on as the new CEO after the company underwent a transformation by dissolving the original cloud gaming company and spinning off a new entity. Well, that didn't last long. A new press release says that Steve is departing to work on his myriad of other projects. Those may include wireless technology called Dido and whatever else he might be working on at his incubator, Reardon Labs. The new OnLive sole investor, Gary Lauder, is the new chairman of the board. And Charlie Jablonski, the former head of operations, is now COO and acting CEO. Travelers within the United States, get ready. You may be able to read on your Kindle during takeoff and landing <gasps> soon. The FAA announced it is forming a government industry group to reevaluate the restrictions on portable electronic devices. However, the group will not consider the airborne borne use of cell phones for voice communications during flight. The FAA will take public comments, and you can email them at pedcomment at faa.gov. We'll have a link with today's episode. You said FAA and soon. Really close together. Well, in like kind of like in the glacial terms. Okay, like all right. In the in like geologic. Yes, got it. All absolutely. right. Uh, Kotaku reports accessory maker PDP was showing off Nintendo Wii U accessories to GameStop store managers when they let slip that the peripherals would be available with the release of the Wii U on November 18th. A PDP senior VP then told Forbes Jason Evangelo that PDP has quote no knowledge whatsoever of the Wii U launch date and was simply stating accessories would be available in stores November 18th. Nintendo has a press announcement coming up September 13th. We'll probably find out for sure then. 
As Apple and Samsung's war rages on, Motorola and Apple are showing them how it's done. A filing reveals that Moto has agreed to license some, if not all, of its standards essential patents to Apple, at least in Germany. The terms seem to include cellular sta uh, standard essential patents, which mean the company's claims regarding Wi-Fi and video codecs could still be used on the offensive, but maybe Motorola had a change of heart after Apple's recent legal victory, and then, of course, pressure from the European Commission to play nice when it comes to Frand. Let's stay Frans. CNET's Topher <laughs> Kessler reports a new vulnerability found last week in the latest Java 7 runtime from Oracle has caught the attention of malware writers. Simply visiting a malicious web page could result in a Java applet running and compromising the system with this kind of malware. The exploit is cross-platform and has been successfully triggered in both Safari and Firefox on Macs running Mountain Lion. Now, there's no known vulnerabilities out there you need to be aware of, and most users probably haven't installed Java 7, but until Oracle's quarterly patch or a third-party patch arrives, the only way to close the vulnerability if you do have Java 7 is to disable the Java plugin or remove the Java runtime altogether. You know when you tweet via an app and you see your tweet and how it was published? Like it says, from TweetBot. Yeah, that, that's gone now. Twitter is no longer sourcing tweets from clients. The official reason is to simplify. This is a change for the web version of Twitter as the mobile version did not include sourcing at all. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by the new Squarespace.com. We've been telling you how fast and how easy Squarespace is for a long time. And if, if it's even possible, they made it faster and easier uh, with the new Squarespace content management system. Uh, it's got HTML5, CSS3, new JavaScript foundations. It's fast, it's flexible, and it redoes your website on the fly for whatever device people are looking at on. Because we don't know. It's not like everybody's sitting around a 19-inch monitor on their desktop anymore, right? They have tablets of all sizes. They have uh, phones. They have music players. Uh, yeah, even people, you know, iPod touches, stuff like that. So what Squarespace does is resizes your website. In fact, any image you upload, it resizes it seven times so that it looks right in the context of the page that it serves dynamically to the device that people are looking at your website on. The new Squarespace also has new page builder tools and a new layout engine that enables you to customize pages in seconds just by adding blocks of content, things like social media content. You want to throw your Twitter feed in there, videos, photos, anything you want. Uh, better social media integration is one of the things they worked really hard to improve on in this new version of Squarespace. But you don't have to listen to me go on and on about it. Go try it out for free. You don't even have to give them a credit card. Just go to squarespace.com, start a website, See if you like it. If you do decide to purchase it, use offer code TNT8 and get 10% off your first purchase on new Squarespace accounts. Whether it's monthly or annual, you get 10% off. But if you do go annual, not only do you get 10% off an entire year, but you get a free domain name as well. That's squarespace.com. Use the offer code TNT8 uh, and uh, let them know that you heard about it right here on Tech News Today. We thank them for the support of the show. All right, let's bring in Harry McCracken, editor-at-large for Time.com, and, of course, the man behind Technologizer. Good to have you back on the show, Harry. Hey, folks. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, Samsung, as we mentioned in the news views, bringing back the start button. Uh, it's in the Samsung Series <laughs> 7 uh, and Samsung Series 5 U.S. Uh, versions that will be coming out on October 26th. Uh, now, just a little background on what these devices are. They're updates to a current line of Samsung all-in-one desktops. Uh, the Series 7 uh, will have 1920 by 2080 multi-touch, 10-point gesture recognition. So you can either touch the screen or you can even do things like turn pages. Uh, say you're reading an e-book on your screen just by being within three feet of the camera on the thing. Uh, you, can, you can rewind by rotating your hand, stuff like that. Uh, also includes a terabyte hard drive, DVD, uh, wireless keyboard, mouse, and remote. The 27-inch version has a Core i7 and 8 gigs of RAM, runs $1,700. The 23.6-inch version has Core i5, 6 gigs of RAM, runs $1,099. And the Series 5, which they're trying to say is a good kitchen computer, if you need a kitchen computer, 21.5 inches, uh, 1920 by 2080, same gesture recognition, a nice slide-away, stowaway keyboard and mouse, Core i3, 500 gigabyte hard drive, 4 gigs of RAM. That one's only $749, though. Uh, but getting a, a lot of the attention today is the Slauncher, the S-Launcher, uh, <laughs> which brings back the, the Start button by giving you a little icon in the middle of your screen that says Start Menu, and it also has a Settings icon that you can click on to get quickly into Settings because a lot of people have been complaining that it's hard to find Settings in Windows 8. 
Uh, Harry, were you one of the people who was bemoaning the lack of a, of a start button in Windows 8? Well, I'm not sure if, if bemoan is the word, but I do find it a little mystifying. Um, Microsoft with Windows 8 is doing all these old inventive things, and I think they're trying to scare themselves and, uh, and tell people this is new and different. But I don't quite understand why they removed the start button. It, it doesn't seem to help, and it, it seems like it's kind of poking people in the eye. And for some people, it's a reason not to go to Windows 8. So I think it's really cool that Samsung is doing for people what Microsoft won't do. Andrew wrote us an email and said he thinks this is why Microsoft decided they needed to release the Surface uh, because uh, they they want to control the interface. And yeah, this is not unusual for for companies to put their own interfaces on top of Windows. Uh, do do we do we think this is a good thing? That I mean, it, it's a crazy, silly name, but is it a good thing to have the Start menu back? I think it's a smart move for Samsung just because their desktop market isn't super, like isn't that great in general. But I, I don't like this move at all because the idea why Microsoft made that change is so that people get used to the change. But if you if you have companies kind of hamstring this this transition, you're going to have this people like, oh, my Samsung still has a start menu. Why don't why doesn't yours? So I guess more people will will buy those products, but it won't help the transition for Microsoft at all. And that I think is kind of bothersome because, I mean, that I've happens all the time though with extensions, right? A company will get rid of a a feature because you know, they think it's for the best and people go, ah, I want that feature back. And then someone will have a little add on that you can use to make it the old way. Man, that happens on Android all the time. And, you know, Samsung is probably guilty of this on, on the Android platform as well. I'm kind of concerned how it's going to work, though. I mean, because yeah. Microsoft solution, obviously, if it's integrated, it's going to work really well versus an add on piece, because I've seen enough customized versions of Windows on laptops and it drives me insane. It just it messes up the UI. It's usually quite ugly. I know the S launcher because Motors are already making fun of it. They're like, look, they co copied Apple's dock because they put a little <laughs> shelf instead yeah, of a... I do a, a, the Apple Samsung passport. jokes are running yeah. fast and furious these but, days. I, I mean, I guess it'll help a lot of people, but I, I would rather just embrace the change. Yeah. We, I, we certainly don't want Windows to become Android where HP is one version of Windows and Samsung is another. Fragmentation. Yeah, I remember uh, Windows 98 box I got from HP back in the 90s that had this awful, absolutely awful uh, interface that it was kind of difficult to get rid of. You had to go and dig, dig into settings and uninstall it. Otherwise, it just would refuse not to launch every time you launch the PC. It was meant to make it easier to get into your computer, but it was, it was it just always annoying. is. I'm yeah. actually <laughs> a fan of that desktop that uses gesture support because the kitchen computer is one area where I've never seen a computer successfully take off because your hands are always mucked up. Mm. And if you can actually just wave around and go, okay, I want to see the next page of this recipe or something, like I would use that a lot more because I've been looking into this for about five or six years now, and I've never been able to find a solution. Other than those washable keyboards and mice, and that doesn't really work when you're when you're baking or something. So I, I, I kind of like the gesture thing, because apparently I'm a cook. You are. You're a, a chef. I don't know. Chef I mean, chef it's eyes. so easy to move a tablet in and out of your kitchen. Your I actually so have cool. my iPad on my counter a lot of the time I'm in the kitchen, but I don't know if I want to dedicate anything in there. Your hands are always that clean, though? You can touch the screen and you're not worried about grease and stuff on it? <sighs> well, I mean, it's... Just clean it off. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not dripping with grease. Uh, it's oleophobic. I'm, I'm a little messier than you are in the kitchen. Maybe that's all. So. All right, let's move on to uh, Twitter's uh, long march of removing features from third-party developers. Yeah, so I as mentioned in the news fuse that we now no longer, if you're using Twitter on the web, uh, which a, a lot of people do, some people exclusively, you're not going to see what kind of a client that tweet was sent from. So I'm using TweetBot for Mac. That's my preferred way of tweeting. Tom no longer knows that unless, you know, he's looking over my shoulder type of a thing. He does. Now, a lot, a lot of uh, folks are trying to come to conclusions as to what does this mean? Yes, yeah, I've got it running right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly, exactly what you thought. Uh, what does it mean? You could, you could, you could be a conspiracy theorist about it. I mean, it, it sounds to me like there's a couple things. Twitter wants to have a unified experience, right? They like the idea of Twitter being Twitter. It's, it's, it's one, it's one app. It's the first party app. Also, if let's say you're new to Twitter or you're you're just beginning to follow somebody maybe who has a really uh, a wide reach and you see that that person is using something called Echophone and you've never heard of that before and you end up clicking on that third party app, you might be more inclined to continue to fragment the experience, which is what Twitter is is worried about. But that's not all that Twitter did. Um, in fact, uh, something that is is really new as far as uh, their changing of APIs and how that is 
uh, harming those in the upper right quadrant of what Twitter considers to be third-party Twitter client apps um, is coming down the pipe. And uh, this involves the company Tapbots, which make TweetBot, which is just one of a handful of successful third-party clients. I use it on my iPhone, actually. Yeah, I use it on my iPhone, my iPad, and on the Mac. But what's interesting is that the Mac version is an alpha version. This is something that they rolled out a couple of months ago, I guess now, and said, listen, we uh, th there's a lot of work to do. This is a new app. It's far from finished. It's not even really technically beta yet, but we certainly want as many of you to download it know that it's not perfect, and give us feedback to make a great experience. Well, because of the changes that Twitter has made to the amount of tokens that third-party apps can use, um, remember that if a client had uh, 100,000 tokens, they could get two times the number of tokens they had, uh, and after that, they'd have to work with Twitter directly. Or whatever amount of tokens... Uh, so for somebody like TweetBot, if they've got a million tokens out and about in the world, meaning that I have given them access to use Twitter's API, so I am using a token, uh, they can basically 2x that, and then they've got to work with Twitter directly. Originally, when this all was coming down the pipe, the folks at uh, TatBot said, we're not really worried about this. From an API standpoint, uh, the changes required for us are trivial, long-term. We really shouldn't be... Uh, in any risk of running out of spots under Twitter's cap anytime soon. So it's sort of like, a okay, well, if they're not worried, maybe we shouldn't be worried either. Things have changed quite a bit. Um, from TapBots this morning, uh, they uh, have announced that they have pulled the TweetBot Alpha app from the, uh, from well, it's not really in the App Store yet because it's just an alpha, but from being downloaded. They said, we have a large but finite limit on the number of user tokens we can get for TweetBot for Mac. We've been working with Twitter over the last few days to try to work around this limit for the duration of the beta, but have been unable to come up with a solution that was acceptable to them. Because of this, we've decided it's best for us to pull the alpha. Now, before you freak out and say, okay, well, that's the end of TweetBots. They're, they have to shut down. They say... TweetBot for Mac will still be available for sale in the near future. We just, they basically can't run the public part of alpha beta testing. They say, we wish we could continue, but we don't make these rules. Sorry. Um, now, it's unclear to me if any updates now are broken on my alpha version of TweetBot for Mac. I mean, I as if you haven't downloaded it, you're out of luck. And if for some reason... I had to reinstall this. I am now out of luck, but I'm not sure if the updates just stop completely because I was already in. Well, you've got a token that's I being do. used, so it Correct. wouldn't make sense to stop updates to that token because it doesn't help them free it up or anything. Yeah. I, I, I think this is, you know, going to be held up as the first casualty of Twitter's new uh, policy and... It, it, it's arguable how much this matters to, to most people, right? Most people don't have access to that alpha anyway. And as long as they're able to get TweetBot updates for their full version eventually, uh, I guess this could slow that down because they don't have as many people participating in the alpha. Certainly doesn't make TapBot very excited to continue working on the Twitter platform, though, does it? No, I can't imagine that they're very happy about this. I mean, they, they've... They've worded things very carefully, but made it pretty clear. Hey, we're trying to work with Twitter. For whatever reason, we can't get more tokens, and this is just no longer working out for us. They've even gone as far as to say, okay, so there are, are a couple different ways that tokens work. If you've got the same account and you're using the same app on multiple devices, like TweetBot on multiple devices, I'm just using that one token. But if you have multiple accounts for the same app, so, you know, maybe you've got four oh. Twitter accounts that you manage. You are using multiple tokens. Now, will mm -hmm. that prevent me from adding more accounts to TweetBot at some point? Perhaps, yeah. Right? Right. Because I've got, let me see, I'm just checking here. I, I know I've got one, two, That was three. also something that I've they... I've got five accounts. So I'm using five tokens on that's TweetBot. That's right. That's right. And tap by... Uh, that's, that's kind of... That's just the way it works right now. It doesn't mean that it's going to work like this forever. But that 
those are the constraints right now. Tapbot says, listen, uh, <laughs> we might encourage you to revoke access to clients that you're not using because they want their token back. That's actually something that you have to go into Twitter settings, see who you've uh, granted access to and say revoke, which sort of sounds like you're saying, I hate you app, you, you know, screw yeah. you type of thing, but it's actually helpful because there are there is now the issue of finite numbers of tokens. Very few num people are going to do that. It's akin to like, can totally. you please turn off your mind fies in the audience? Sort right. Of, sort of. <laughs> we really want to run this demo. I think very few people that use Twitter are going to actually notice this. I mean, I mean, the vast majority is not going to notice this. I think several will notice. But the thing is, if Twitter's stripping out this little sent from tweet bot or sent by this other device or other client, people might not discover those things. They don't even realize that there's another way to get Twitter. I mean, at, at some point, you just think that the web is the only way to go. And the, to this idea that it's simple, a little bit more simple, I mean, Twitter's added a lot more information as you hover over things, you know, view video, reply, retweet, uh, promote it. So there's a lot, of, a lot of text on that already. To remove that to say it's simplicity seems like the smart answer PR-wise. Yeah, we're simplifying it. But it looks like Twitter just wants you to just simply access it on the web. This is the experience they can control 100%. Or in their app. Oh, yeah. Or the, well, yeah, whatever they can control 100%, that's where they want you. And because they have all these deals with advertisers and things, they want to make sure that those people are getting their money's worth so they can stay in business. Harry, what do you make of all this? Well, I, I think the biggest news this week is that they cut off Tumblr, which um, you know has millions and millions and millions of users, and you, you won't be able to find your Twitter friends on Tumblr anymore. And the, I mean, you, it's certainly easy to understand why Twitter is doing this. They're, they they need to monetize the service, and that's easiest to do when you control it. But I do wish they were a little more straightforward about what they're up to. When you read their blog posts, they're awfully cryptic, and um, that explains why the the, the, um, the tap bots folks at first thought things would be fine, and then a few days later it said, "Wait a minute, this is not going to be okay." And if Twitter just sort of came out and spelled out how things would be from now on, I'd feel a lot better about it. Yeah, I think they, they're starting to run into a very typical problem with engineering-focused companies like Google and Facebook have run into this as well, is not having the best communication with their audience, whether it's their customers yeah. or their developers. Uh, we, we've seen Just that tell time us. again. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to move on to uh, Apple and Motorola striking that deal in Germany. Ayaz, is this patent piece? I got to check the bumper. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. It is. Good, good. It's confirmed. Yeah, otherwise, I wouldn't have known. Thank the you. Birds are true. As Sarah mentioned, the news views. Uh, Motorola and Apple have a deal in Germany where Moto is going to license some of its standard essential patents to Apple. The full details aren't known yet, like what's the royalty rate or the full extent of the deal. But the agreement also includes an admission by Apple that's liable for past damages related to these patents. And the royalty rate can be set by German courts. And the, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up in the discussion section was, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about the wars and like that's the sexy story people love writing about that because it's a feud right like oh two people two giant companies are coming at each other all day but deals like this happen a lot even though one arm of apple and 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 motorola could be suing each other the other arm was kind of going okay we got to work this out because we have to do business together so the other thing is some people are thinking that motorola well after in, in light of the samsung case maybe doesn't want to play hardball too much with apple uh, Tom, do you think this is the sign of bigger things to come after that giant case, or is this... I, I can't imagine that uh, the case gets resolved Friday, and by Monday, Motorola has changed its strategy suddenly. I mean, an agreement like this is in the works for a little longer than that. So I, I think it's it's likely that this is just what was going to happen there. Uh, and like you said, sometimes companies actually do come to agreements ab about things. It's it's not all a big uh, battle of, of babies and brats uh, as much as the headline writers would like it to be. Harry, what do you think about it? Well, I mean, one scenario for the, the post-Apple winning over Samsung world is that everybody just does agreements and pays licensing fees as appropriate. Apple already has that deal with Microsoft. Um, Microsoft is not going to get sued over Windows phones by Apple because they, they've arranged to um, cross-license technology. And probably that's the best thing for everybody concerned. I, I really hope that companies stop suing each other and get back to building nice devices and if, if they agree to work together rather than agree to sue each other it would be so much better for everybody yeah i and i think the companies agree too there's very few companies 
out there that are engaged in some other kind of business that want to spend time in court battling about patents. Now, there's there's companies whose entire business is based on battling in court about patents. I'm not talking about them. But your Apples and your Samsungs and your Motorola's, they they would rather save that money uh, that they're spending on these lawsuits, I have a feeling. And Microsoft negotiation team must be fantastic because, I mean, they've had, they have the deal with Apple that's longstanding, but they also have all those deals with those Android manufacturers. Anybody who makes a handset, almost any company that makes a handset is paying royalties to Microsoft for using Android. So these deals do work out. They're just not as exciting when something works out. It's like, oh, look at that train go by. Nothing happened. Well, and then these are standards essential patents. It used to be the case if you saw a standards essential patent dispute that you expected it to, 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 to get settled fairly easily because it is standards mm -hmm. essential and they have to license it. It's only recently that we've even seen these FRAND mm -hmm. standards essential patents start to get dragged into knockdown, drag out battles. Hopefully more. And of obviously, it. Apple has tremendous leverage right now because if, if that decision holds up, then everybody else is going to have to be a little timid about intruding on its patents. So if, if Apple wants to do those deals right now, it's in a really good spot. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Carbonite Online Backup. Ask yourself this question and answer honestly because you don't have to tell me. You have to tell yourself, are your files backed up right now? And are they backed up in two different places so that if one of them does suffer disaster, the other one can save your bacon? Well, if the answer's not yes, then you need to listen up. Uh, you, you want your files backed up automatically and continually. You want them kept safely off-site, away from computer crashes, viruses, fire, theft. I recommend, the way and way, the way I live is I have a local backup separate from my machine, and I have a cloud backup. Uh, and to really be protected, you need that online backup, and Carbonite is there for you. With Carbonite, your files are automatically and continually backed up. They're stored safely off-site, and if you have a computer disaster, it's easy to restore them. Plus, you can access your backed-up files privately on any computer or on your smartphone or iPad with a free app. Unlimited backup for your PC or Mac is not expensive either. It's only $59 a year, and you can try it for free. Go to Carbonite.com, enter the offer code TNT. You'll get two bonus months free if you decide to buy with that offer code. Be sure to sign up for the free trial from the homepage to get the two months free. No credit card required for the free trial. That's Carbonite.com, offer code TNT, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. So, Sarah, yes, we, Tom. we mentioned that Craigslist uh, mapping thing in the news fuse. Yeah, you know, it's funny. People always complain that Craigslist hasn't really been updated design-wise or functionality in a million years. I mean, Craigslist is, is a real web pioneer, but doesn't look much different than it did in the early days. And I can't speak for Craig Newmark, but I feel like his response is, don't need to. Works great. Yeah, we're a community. What is it? If I do it, the Craig Newmark, <laughs> we're just a bunch of nice people helping the community. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you could see this either uh, as a move forward or a move to squash competitors, at least in the San Francisco Bay Area and the Portland area, in housing sections, so still is a very limited rollout, Craigslist has started testing map views. So if I'm looking at an apartment, I see the neighborhood, then I now can look at a view of exactly where that apartment is on a map in San Francisco, for example. Uh, they are using OpenStreetMaps. Uh, mm -hmm. OpenStreetMaps, of course, is, they're not the only ones to use this. Um, Foursquare and Apple in iOS 6 are going to start uh, working with OpenStreetMaps. Uh, this is a community data uh, map, so you can think of it as like Wikipedia for maps type of a thing. Um, last month, though, Craigslist had filed copyright infringement lawsuits against PadMapper and 3Taps. Uh, PadMapper was obtaining data from 3Taps on where exactly uh, locations of Craigslist uh, listings were. Uh, three taps was scraping it from search engine listings of Craigslist posts. PadMapper displayed other listings too, so it wasn't just like, oh, we're just cloning Craigslist. It was a, it was an aggregate, and Craigslist certainly didn't like that. But you know, you mentioned Tom that you thought that this seems almost like a, an answer to what PadMapper was doing. Craigslist saying, well, we don't want you to do that, and in fact, we'll just go ahead and build it ourselves. This should be something that's in Craigslist. I hadn't actually thought about that until you mentioned it. Because I read it as, oh, Craigslist was already working on its own map views. And when PadMapper rolled out and people seemed to kind of like it and think that it was a good service, they wanted to shut it down before they actually had a legitimate competitor. 
Yeah, I think it was according to an OSM board member that they're, Craigslist is hosting the maps themselves. That's yeah. why I thought it was a longer term plan as well. Because yeah, and you may be right. It just it seems because it didn't they didn't come out right away and say, look, we're going to provide this functionality. But then maybe that's just them not being communicative like we like we were talking about earlier. And it seems like a big move for Craigslist to go with OpenStreetMaps over something like Google because Google charges a certain amount of money for their API, map API, after you reach a limit. And Craigslist, I mean, people check that all the time. So Craigslist would have to pay a lot of money or start charging for some of these ads a little mm -hmm. bit more if they didn't use OSM. So, I, I mean, it seems like a smart business move. And it's just interesting to see Craigslist get any kind of change at all. I mean, that's just, I'm just so used to seeing everything like, okay, you have to click well, this little link for Google Map. And that's why I thought that, you know, PadMapper's actually been around for a while. I feel like Craigslist got goosed into doing this because they saw how popular it was and decided, okay, you know, we, we want to do this too. But it's not like Craigslist makes extra amount of money. I don't see why they had to shut PadMapper down, I guess is what I'm saying. They could have rolled this out with OpenStreetMap, uh, integrated into their service, and crushed PadMapper by just being more convenient and available in Craigslist. Yeah, that's the way I feel too. I, and Craigslist has always been... Their whole approach to everything is that it's they were encouraging innovation and uh, it, this. Yeah, the, they're usually very much about openness. They're using OpenStreetMap as, ex as an example. Exactly, of that. Yeah. and yeah, I mean, if I if I've got map views on Craigslist, where's oh, which is where I'm going to find the majority of listings anyway, and I really do. I mean, it, again, they're only uh, using this in housing for a couple different markets in the U.S. to begin with. But as far as location-based stuff for sale, you'd think that this would roll out in, in a variety of other uh, categories soon. Well, apartment hunting is definitely the best use case for this. When you, when you like, decide, like, all right, I'm, I'm going to go to this neighborhood in Oakland because uh, it's convenient and uh, it's an up-and-coming, it's got cool restaurants. What are the apartments available there? It's a pain to try to find that. Oh, totally. With, but I mean, but it could apply like to, you know, tickets for sale. Where, oh, sure. where are we going to meet and pick it up? Where's this car? That kind of thing. Yeah, oddly, it's not like, it's the, the, the implementation on Craigslist is not like PadMapper. It's not like you get a map and you get like 15 points. Right. It's when you go to a listing, there's a map embedded. So you get to see that one point on a map already. So it doesn't seem as convenient as something like PadMapper. So I just, it's well, like, maybe that's why they say <laughs> PadMapper actually has the better product. They have a much better product. Shut it down. That's how I found a new place. Yeah, maybe, that, maybe that's the solution to that. Harry, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, as far as I know, we've only heard the PadMapper guy's version of the story. And, uh, I don't think Craig's list has really explained why they got in his way, especially since he was going through that intermediary service. And in theory, it wasn't really um, having an impact on Craig's list servers. Yeah, it, it didn't seem like it anyway. All right. Uh, I, I know, Harry, you uh, posted on Twitter about this uh, story as well. Lex Friedman at Macworld has a, has the write-up about it. Uh, Apple Easy Pay. That's the uh, ability to take the Apple Store app, walk into an Apple Store, scan a barcode, tap a button to pay, log into your Apple account, get a link to a receipt, walk out of the store. You never have to talk to anybody unless the security guy says, hey, can I see your receipt? You show it to him on your iPhone. However... 18-year-old Eric Schein did not have that experience when he went to the New York Fifth Avenue store on August 20th for a genius appointment. He was having a little trouble, trouble with his trackpad on his new MacBook Pro Retina. Uh, as he was walking up to his appointment, he scanned a pair of Bose headphones uh, and thought he had paid for them. At least he says he did. Went and asked a guy for a bag at the store. That's one of the things it actually says on the app. It's like, if you need a bag, just ask an employee. Uh, the, re the employee did not ask him to show his receipt when he gave him the bag. And so he put the headphones in the bag, went to his genius appointment, sat there, got, got it worked on. As he was walking out of the store, an undercover security person and a store manager stopped him and accused him of trying to steal the headphones. Uh, so he pulled out his iPhone to show the receipt and instead found that the pay now button was showing. He hadn't actually completed the transaction. Store manager said, you were trying to steal that. Don't try to try to fool us. We know what you're up to. We're calling the police. So they did. They called the police. Shine spent a night in a holding cell because he was in New York City and he's from New Jersey. So they, that's the way the out-of-state rules apply. He had to spend the night in jail. Uh, they offered him one day community service and one day of larceny class for a reduced sentence. He said, no, you should. they, they should not have arrested me in the first place. I was. They didn't even give me a chance to finish paying. I would have paid for it right then. Uh, so he's facing larceny charges in October. He's going to try to get the charges dropped. He's he's talking about doing a civil suit, even if he does get the charges dropped. Uh, 
And he did go use Easy Pay to buy the headphones. He's banned <laughs> from the Fifth Avenue store, but apparently he went to the Grand Central store uh, and and used Easy Pay, bought the headphones, Afterwards? no problem. After yeah. he got out of the Because he still wanted the, the headphones. Well, he got out of the clink, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> it's, it's like sort of impossible to know what really happened, right? I mean, if he was trying to get away with some headphones and thought, in the event that somebody stops me, I want to make it look like it was just a careless, oh, I thought I pressed it, the right. button and I That's didn't. That's how you do it. But, and, yeah. you know, I guess Apple's policy, or maybe they've never come across this before, is like, yeah, if we get to a situation like that, we know that somebody is clearly trying to uh, make off with something because our technology isn't that hard to use. But they can't prove that he wasn't just, I mean, carelessness does not mean... You're a thief. The uh, uh, from from both the Macworld store and a couple other places I looked, the 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 general feeling and encouragement in the Apple store is to trust the customer and if you and and to give them a chance to do the right thing. And Shine saying that's not what happened here. Again, we have his word against the store manager that there wasn't anything else up to. But the more I read about the story, the the more likely I'm to believe that Shine was either pulling a a con almost too clever for himself. Uh, or he really it was just really distracted uh, and nervous and, and probably acting shifty, which may have set the store manager off to think that that something bad was going on here. Or maybe the store manager was having a bad day. Maybe he Who had knows? too much coffee and he seemed nervous. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's just, you know, I've had <laughs> those days where you, you've just had a busy day. Uh, your trackpad's broken. You're upset. You just want to buy the headphones and leave. Oh, crap, you forgot to press the button and you didn't check the receipt because you're so distracted and in a hurry. And now the store manager's giving you grief. Who knows? He he may have had a bunch of attitude when they approached him because mm -hmm. he's in that state. And so they give him, uh, you know, less less credence. I mean, Harry, you you said that, that you well, could see this sort of thing happening, right? Well, I, I've used Easy Pay many times, and I always, when I walk out the door, I always feel like this is the time they're going to pounce on me. And I, I thought back to one time when I used it, when I wanted to buy two things, and I scanned both of them, and I was a little bit confused about what was going on, and I eventually realized if you're going to do two things, you need to do them entirely separately. But I, I came very close to thinking I had paid for two things when I had paid for one. And so when I read the story, well, well, we don't know what happened with this guy, I did sort of think, something like this could have happened to me because I did get confused and, and I almost thought I had bought two things when I hadn't. Yeah. I yeah, see the easy pay story. It just reminds me like when you go to the supermarket and you're trying to you know do your own self checkout. I always run into problems with that. So at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm not bothering with this because they're going to bring an assistant over anyway. I might as well wait in line and wait for this because I always get nervous when it comes to something like easy pay because again, it's like, okay, did it really go through? Are you sure? Is that it? Are you positive? Because like Harry, I do not want to get some security guys coming after me because I forgot to tap a button because my screen protector was not helping me do a, a transaction. And, and honestly, I, I think the moral of this story is not, oh, look at Easy Pay messing up, but uh, we don't see this happen. It's actually a big deal that a story like this happened. Uh, so it usually works very well. People generally are positive about it. Uh, the only negative review on the Easy Pay app, according to Lex Friedman at Macworld, was from uh, Eric Schein talking <laughs> about his experience spending a night in jail. Uh, so I, I, you know, the moral of the story is be careful when you use it and check and make sure you got a receipt. Uh, and I would imagine it's un it seems very unusual, it probably happens a lot, that people do try to scam this system and get caught, and it doesn't turn into a, a big issue because the Apple Store employees are trying to, you know, deliver on customer satisfaction. That is how they have been measured up until now. Now, apparently that's changing. There's a CNET story today uh, saying that the new head of Apple Retail, Browett, is uh, changing the stores to judge employees on sales of accessories. Uh, so expect to get hassled. To, to buy some cases next time you go to the Apple store, I guess, uh, rather than customer satisfaction. But let's finish up with uh, Google adding ads below its search box to its own product. Yeah, today, uh, if you go to Google.com, you'll see an, a text ad says, the playground is open, the new $199 tablet from Google, and then the Nexus 7 pops up out of a sleeve, this little line. And when you click it, you can actually go to the Play Store and pick up the 8 and 16 gigabyte models, which is 16 gigabyte. Marissa Meyer is rolling over in her Yahoo office. <laughs> it's back in, in, in the stores. But like, this is, uh, yeah, uh, Google's, <laughs> you got me thinking about Yahoo. Google uh, has had text ads for the Nexus before, uh, the, their phones, but they've never had an ad like this where it's animated and it gets in your face. 
I mean, it's within Google's right to do this. It's their page. They don't usually have advertising at all. Is this uh, is this this kind of move? Is this a sign of bigger things to come with Google? Are we going to see without Marissa Meyer? Are we going to see a lot more ads on that front page? Because a lot of people still have Google.com as their homepage, and this comes up, and that's a really valuable spot. I mean, Amazon does it with the Kindle. It's front page, but if it's on the front of Google, that could really stir sales. I don't know. You're right. A lot of people go to Google.com. I'm not one of those people. I'm the person who's like the last to see any Google Doodle that everyone thinks is really cool because I just don't go. So I'm blissfully unaware of this stuff. And yeah, I mean, if you think of something like uh, Facebook, right? You sign out of Facebook on the web and, and there's advertising there. But it's not quite the same um, the, because the Google... Facebook is sort of, I'm going into the Facebook network and I'm going to do stuff within there. Uh, although, because of their open graph, it's a lot more convoluted now. But Google is, in many ways, you're not, you're not visiting Google the brand. It has nothing to do with Google. You're just trying to get to the site that you want to go to, and that's the easiest way to get there. So, it's ugly. I'll say that much. That's an ugly ad. Harry, do you on think a nice white screen. Harry, do you think we're going to see a lot more ads on Google, or do you think this is just like a one-off because they're trying to get the Nexus 7 out the door? Well, uh, like you guys were saying, every so often Google does put something on the homepage, and I feel like every time they do, it's a little pushier. I, I do feel like we're in kind of the era of Google being more obnoxious than it once was. Like yesterday I was looking at my Google Calendar, and I noticed that Google Plus had inserted a an item on my calendar <laughs> for some uh, Google Hangout with Zagat, which Google owns. Uh, and I have no idea how that got on my on my calendar, and I really wish it hadn't been there. And, uh, and there's a whole thing with a little tote board of Google Plus updates, which appears almost everywhere. I, th I think Google really does sort of have a strategy these days of cross-promotion in a way that it, it once intentionally did not do. Yeah, it's all about perception, right? Uh, so we're used to seeing a nice, clean Google interface. And when they put an ad there, it bugs us. But they've done it yeah. before. So all of a sudden now it's a better ad, right? Because with a little user interaction, it rolls out this this the very fancy-looking advertisement. And so that annoys us even more. You go to Bing. Uh, it's not as clean as Google off the top, but I don't see any ads to the Microsoft Surface anywhere. I don't see a thing to buy Windows. However... Go to ask.com. You're going to see a Toyota ad. You're going you're gonna to see a lot of links. Uh, so, you know, nobody's making a big deal how ask.com has a big banner ad on their page every day. It's all about market share and expectation. And uh, Google has the biggest market share, so they're going to get the attention. And the expectation is I don't see ads when I'm at google.com. So change is always a, a big issue. Uh, and, you, and, and you're going to get people complaining because it's different. I don't have a problem with it because that's not how I use Google. I go to the address bar to use Google. So I would never see this ad unless I read mm -hmm. the stories about it. Yeah, the Google page has gotten a bunch of changes over the past year, right? That black bar on the top, the little the sign-in aspect, that the, tote board, the little uh, tally board for your plus notifications, as, as Harry mentioned. And now an ad, I think it's starting to get a little cluttered up there. I'd like it cleaned off. Maybe I bet there's going to be... An extension to remove it because once you see something like this, <laughs> I want a clean Google page. If it might already be. I bet it's out. Uh, yeah, already. it might already be out there. All right, let's it'll move be on. Interesting to oh, go ahead, Eric. Sorry. I was just going to say, it'll be interesting to see with Marissa Meyer at Yahoo whether they kind of go in the in the simple clean mode, which they've, they've never done in the past. Yeah, I mean, when you go to yahoo.com, it's not the same, like, where's right? Where's the search because, on Yahoo? Very uh, tough. <laughs> it, well, but that's a portal page. Can you just get a search page if you go to yahoo.com slash search? Yeah, you do. I, yeah. And it has a big video introducing you to Yahoo Access access for your desktop. What do you know? That's still alive? Yeah, yes. they just added the desktop version. That's what this is all about. I thought that was into now. Uh, so they have a big ad for one of their own products. Not quite the same as a retail product like Nexus 7, but almost almost the same. All right, let's move on to the random item. Randomizer. Mind hackers are after your brain waves. Take them. Actually, Again? true. Security researchers have used emotive headsets to capture people's subconscious responses to stimuli and use them to uncover data directly from the subject's brains. And they say it's a theoretical risk to privacy in the future. <laughs> this idea that, they could, that you'd be seeing images while this helmet is on you and then you might kind of like your pin number will come out or pin. I know that's, that's redundant. Uh, when <laughs> your pin comes out. I mean, it, it seems like this is a, this could make people worry a lot about privacy concerns, but you do have to have this thing on your head. You might notice it. 
just a chance. You know, if somebody's just like, hey, Sarah, could you try on this hat? Now, just think about yeah. this Rorschach. Ding, ding. Thank you very much. Here. <laughs> Yeah, you, exactly. You, can you have take to it off sit him down. Let me show you a picture. Do you recognize this house? No, this. Th oh, that's your house. You re I could tell you recognize. I'm gonna it go from rob you. Yeah, right. It's <laughs> Keep that so hat on. So you stay here with the hat on. <laughs> I'll be at your house. Hackers are gonna rig those uh, those perm dryers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like like the card readers that they yes, put exactly. at the uh, ATMs. <laughs> they're gonna they're slip those gonna slip in there. So when you go get a perm, stylists. yeah, hair drying yeah. skimmers. <laughs> <laughs> Air drying skimmers. I do like the idea of this, right? It's like, uh, you know, you smell coffee in the morning, even though you haven't had it, it can sort of start your adrenaline going, right? Because you know that once you have it, you're, you know, Pavlov's dog kind of thing. I love the idea that if you, be, if you are stimulated by something, you might be able, you might, you might not be able to help thinking of something that's personally identifiable, like yeah. a pin or an account number or something that's like, I mean, that's not a, physiological thing that's a I'm thinking something secret in my head and somehow you can glean that out of my silly hat it's cool this is great yeah. technology and and I'm glad that security researchers are already working on it you may think well this is ridiculous this is never going to happen it's not going to happen now but let's let's pen test it well, you know, while it's not out in the public and available and find out what the risk may or may not be. I think it's great. It'd be nice to attach it to like an iPhone or an iPod. And it's like, well, you're getting a little tense. Let's just change the music so it's a little bit more mellow. It can tell yeah. subconsciously you're getting a little agitated. Why don't we put on some Bach for you? That happened a lot in the car, I have a feeling, for a lot of people. All right, let's see what's on the calendar, shall we? All right. T-Mobile Memo is asking staff to sell against the iPhone on September 21st. This is a whole nano sim. So what does T-Mobile know? Well, <laughs> <laughs> one would venture a guess that maybe this all has to do with the new iPhone. Mm, that's but that's best. not that's official yet. Guess. It's all just that's rumor and guessing. conjecture. The new what now? Oh, it's a new phone. Yeah, it's sure. from company. Fruit. Based. Tomorrow, Samsung is holding a Samsung Mobile Unpacked event in Berlin and has confirmed that they're unveiling the next Galaxy Note. They're not calling it the Galaxy Note 2, just the next one. And finally, Firefox 15 is arriving in finished form on August 29th. In fact, that's tomorrow, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Promising truly stealthy updates for everybody. Woohoo! Yeah. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got an email from Nathan in good old Austin, Texas. Keep Austin weird, Nathan. Uh, he says, uh, I agree with Tom on the idea that the public overreacts very often on privacy issues. I think I have a reason why this is good, though. If we didn't overreact, then companies would simply push different limits. If no one had complained about companies like Google or Apple knowing our location at all times, it would be common for any random app to be tracking you all the time. Overreacting to all the little things means that none of the big issues get through. While it doesn't look very organized, the discussion of things like sharing location happened because people cried out about it. I do believe it does limit how quickly some services can innovate. But right now, I think the discussion on sharing anything or privacy is worth a little slowdown. In every situation I can think of in the past five years, which includes all the Facebook privacy issues, I can't think of one that has tainted my view of a company currently. I'm sure I'm not the norm as I generally understand why or how someone like Path knows some contact info already. I don't see the masses leaving Facebook, Google, Apple, or others due to privacy. Most people seem to care in the short term, but as long as the company reacts, the masses don't leave. Harry, you think this is a good thing for, for reasonable people that crazy people overreact uh, to issues because it just helps keep everything on target? I do think you sort of want to keep the pressure on these companies, and if, if nobody seem to care the companies would push too far uh that said there is there are a lot of crazy things and i mean i always think back to when gmail started and some legislator in california attempted to have gmail made illegal because it was scanning your email to put up ads so uh, that kind of stuff is nuts but i think if general consumers are skeptical it's a good thing yeah i think nathan's got a good point here thanks for writing in uh nathan good to, good to have your feedback that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. You can uh, submit stories to us if you're like, hey, I, I would like you to cover this story. Go to technewstoday.reddit.com and submit it. And then all the folks in the audience, or at least the 9,000 or so who are members of the subreddit, uh, have a chance to vote it up or down if they don't like it. And we take a look at that when we create the show every day. And uh, thank everybody who goes in there and takes part in it. And we thank the mods for keeping it nice and clean and useful. It's technewstoday.reddit.com. Harry McCracken, uh, great to have you on the show. Let folks know uh, what's going on over there at Technologizer these days. Well, um, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff. If you go to technologizer.com, you'll land with endtime.com. And 
a section that's just me, and I'm also part of Techland.com, which is Time's umbrella for all its tech coverage. Uh, all right. Uh, are you are you guys uh, doing much coverage of the EFA stuff? A little bit less this year, uh, but I'm sure we'll have some stuff from there. All right, check it out. Technologizer with a Z. Dot com and techland.com. Great to have you, Harry. Thank you. Uh, great to have everybody in the audience joining us today. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. Or you can give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody.